Hey, Mr. Palmer, wow, it's working. Tell me what to do <laughs> to make all my love late dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lust. The Palm Boss. I'm going a little bit early because last week I tried to do this and it put me off. It wouldn't let me go live, so I'm going to sneak in just a little bit early and there goes the music again. Holy cow, what am I going to do here? I need to get rid of that. So, hey, let's let's have a little fun. Let's talk some fish stuff. Let me see what's going on here. Looks like Drew Bachman's already checking in. Let me see if I can see the comments down here. No comments yet, so... uh it's like we got four viewers. Hey, anyway, I'm not going to sit here and play that little game trying to figure out if I know what I'm doing or not because we all already know I don't. So, uh, look at there. There's Scott checking in from, uh, I think, if I remember right, Scott, you're up in Missouri. Danny Mack, good evening, you guys. Hey, thanks for joining in tonight. Hey, you guys know the drill. Hashtag Palm Moss Magazine in the comments section. Click like. Share this. To your timeline, you're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Moss hat and something else that Leanne's going to send, like a t-shirt or something. By the way, she actually, uh, I remember to tell her to have the drawing today. And Doug Cusick is our latest winner. Doug is a regular on here, so I'm hoping we'll uh, hear from him tonight. So let's see here. Danny Mack, Zach Bollinger, Drew Bachman, Palm Boss Rocks from South Cackalack, South Carolina. Good to see all y'all. So it looks like we got about 13 folks checking in so far. Um, now it's telling me something. I, I really need a producer. Anybody out there know a producer that knows how to do this stuff? Hello, Brad Cates. Glad to see you guys. Had a little cold front kind of slither down from the Arctic Circle, didn't we? You know, it uh, here down here and around Granbury, Texas, it was 38 degrees. It was right at freezing in North Texas along the Red River and points east. Hey, there's Tim Stewart. I think you've had a birthday like today or something. Tim Stewart from Florida and other places. Mark Hainline. Good to see Mark. I don't remember Mark. I'm glad to see you here. So I don't really have a topic for tonight. However, I kind of do. So I really do want to tap into your questions tonight, folks. So if you have a question, post it up here and we're going to talk about it. Uh... Yeah, birthday today. So everybody wish Tim Stewart a happy birthday. Tyler Shockham Markley from Wichita, Kansas. Sweet. Andy, Tim is in Florida. I thought he was. I know he was, I think he was in New Jersey over the weekend for an early birthday celebration. At least that's what his mother posted on Facebook. <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> I should never say anything about somebody's mother posting anything. There was some snow in West Virginia and Ohio and Pennsylvania. Yeah, I saw Drew Hay, who may be on here. Hey, Doug Cusick, guess what? You won the drawing, dude. We need your, uh, I don't think we've got your mailing address, so send an email to info at pondboss.com and put your shipping address down there because you've got a, a hat and a T-shirt. Plus, I think Leanne needs to know your T-shirt size. So she's going to be sending you a Pond Boss hat and a T-shirt. So send an email with your... Shirt size and your shipping address where you would like to have that Palm Boss merch. I always thought that, that word that, that word hits me in the pet peeve section. Merch? I guess you can't say merchandise or stuff. Um I got a uh, I got a call from a longtime client who called me a couple of weeks ago and he wanted to set up a lake evaluation survey. There's a lot of backstory between he and I. We go back over thirty years. And when I sold the pond management side of my business, he went along with the, the purchase. So <coughs> I didn't spend as much time working with him <coughs> after I sold the pond management division of my company. And so, uh, but he still calls me. He still wants to talk about the different pond management things. He still wants to hear about what I think about his lakes because I did help him design it, helped him, you know, redesign it, change things up. Uh, and start growing some good fish. And so the lake, after it was rehabilitated, drained, cleaned out, renovated, was it, now he's probably seven years in. And he just wants to be sure that it's on a good track. So he was talking to me the other day. He says, hey, listen, I want you to come and meet the electrofishing guys up here and let's go shock my lake and take a look at it and see, you know, see how the fish are growing. 
So I said, well, heck, that sounds great. Yep, I can do that. So then he calls me yesterday, and my wife and I, I love my wife. And for those of you that have met her, you can see she's a, she's a fiery go-getter, um, feisty, pretty, um, thoughtful woman. And, 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 and uh, Tim's met her, you know, here, there's Fred. Fred knows my wife just almost as good as I do, you know? And so, uh, anyway, we were at the state fair of Texas yesterday all day long and the weather was perfect, had a great time. Well, this client calls me and I look on my phone and I, and I, and I see it and I think, Ooh, I don't know if I think, yeah, I'll answer. So I answered it. He says, Hey Bob, I don't really work. I don't want to, I'm not worried about surveying the lake anymore. He says, one of my good friends, he's a great angler was out there over the weekend and he's there today and over uh over two and a half days of fishing he's caught over 80 bass and the most of them are small he says we need to be calling some and you know they're all in great shape he did catch a seven and a half and he did catch some fours and fives and a handful of sixes so uh uh yeah hey chris blood yeah the sign it, look at there it's on the wall sure is and she didn't argue with me at all she just handled it so uh um, Anyway, he said, I think we need to call off the survey. So, I want to hear your thoughts about that. Should we? So, this angler, who's a really good angler, by the way, he, he's got a little fame behind him because of the things that he does, because he's so good at it. When he catches that many fish in a, in a short period of time, and they're all in pretty good shape, but the majority of them are 14, 13, 15 inches long, He's thinking that he needs to be calling some bass. So, what do you think about that? Tell me what you're thinking about that. So, uh, pitch that at me. Give me some ideas. And then I'm going to circle back to that here in a minute. And we'll talk about it. Doug Cusick, large, large shirt. Got it. Okay, Tyler Shockham Markley. Working on getting my neighborhood pond set up for great fishing. Got a diffused aeration installed. Trying to get some bluegill stocked. We have a nasty weed problem. Might get grass carp too. Pond is 12-ish feet deep. That's good. If we can help you, let us know. Sounds like you got your brain wrapped around what you want to do with that. Yep. Um, shocker fan. Yeah, Wichita State. Yeah, the, <laughs> the sign even looks centered. <laughs> it kind of is. <laughs> hey, Michael Gray, good to see you. Mike Trail, good to see you. Yep, so uh, Fred's saying, yeah, I call the smallest. Okay, so now that lake is in about its seventh year, and I've lost track of him over the last three years because he wasn't my client, although he's been a friend, and he does ask me his, his, my advice. So she, Fred says, call some small bass without doing any harm. Any other, any other advice? A fun little red wine right there. I get to drink red wine on Wednesdays. Debbie goes to a Bible study and I do this. <laughs> I don't know who has more fun. Okay, so Zach Bollinger says, well, I'd be leery about going of that. Plus, depending on how big it is, he might be fishing for a while. That lake is 26 acres. Most of it, it sits right adjacent to a wetlands and three of the four shorelines are above natural ground level, which means that three-fourths of the shoreline is a dam, is a levee. And he built the levee up to get it above the wetlands to keep his lake out of the flood zone. So, uh, hello, Vito. Good to see you, buddy. So, Zach says he'd be leery about doing that. Plus, depending on how big the lake is, he might be fishing for a while. So, what Fred is saying is call some smaller bass. So, I'm going to tell you this. That does no harm, and it probably helps. Because the lake's in what year? The seventh year. And you know that by now that the fish have reproduced a number of times. Reproduced at least the last four years. So, keep throwing your thoughts out there. Drew Bachman, I have a one half acre spring fed pond. I use Aquamax 500 and spread it by hand. What's a good amount to put out once a day and when should I stop feeding with the winter coming out? Bluegill, shellcracker, and some largemouth bass. Well, here's the, here's the way I see that. Just feed enough that they'll clean it up within about five minutes. No longer, you shouldn't see any. Of course, Aquamax 500 doesn't float very long because it's small pellets. So, 
let ha, let them eat what they'll clean up within five minutes. If they if you throw it out there and it's gone in thirty seconds, feed a little bit more. Now, as the water temperature begins to drop, the fish's metabolism will begin to drop. They'll slow down, so their food requirements will slow down. So as the water temperature gets a little cooler, then they they won't eat nearly as much. So um, I'm going to tell you that by the time the water hits. 50 degrees that the majority of your bluegills have stopped feeding. Now, one of the real important things about feeding fish, same place, same time, consistency. That's the big deal about feeding fish. As consistent as you are, that's as consistent as they'll be. And with the price of that fish food, it's important to be consistent. Mark Dauber calls wine props. Yeah, I know that's because you drink martinis. <laughs> I do too from time to time, but nothing better than a good glass of red wine. Uh-oh, uh-oh, Fred's, Fred's sipping a little whiskey tonight. I see that. You know what? Somehow I knew that. Those six to seven pounders might eat a few 12 to 13 inch fish. Need to get some big bait in there. Get them males out. Oh, that's, that's good advice. That's real good advice. So, where I'm kind of going, what I'm fishing for here. Oh, what a terrible pun. What I'm fishing for is is he's called off the electrofishing survey or has chosen not to do it because a really good angler had a great day and said, hey, your fish look great. There's too many small ones. The big ones are fat. So I would call small bass. That's what the angler's telling him. There's nothing wrong with that advice except when a bass angler is out there fishing, what's he doing? He's chasing bass. He's trying to catch bass. That's his deal. Is he is he sticking a night crawler on the bottom of a, you know, a, a, a brim hook under a bobber and trying to catch any bluegills? No, he's not. Can he see what the bait fish looks like underwater with with uh, polarized sunglasses? No, he can't. Now he did say the water's pretty clear. Actually, I talked to him, and he said the water's really clear. He could see down, and, and when he throws his, a, a swim bait out there. Five or six bass chase the swim bait all the way to the to the boat. So when I had the conversation with him today, he said, hey, are you still going to do that survey? I said, yeah, we're going to do the survey. So I'm going to get that lined up, and here's here's where I'm going uh, with that. Is, is a, a great day angling is valuable information, especially if some of those bass had been weighed and measured and logged down and given to me. You know, when, when, when a seasoned fisherman tells me that bass are in good shape, I believe that. But what I really believe is links and weights. If I can see the links and weights of those fish, then I can make a better judgment call. You know, but when you put that electrofishing boat in the water and you go out there and you start taking random samples of fish by shocking them up, you can see what's going on that gives you an underwater snapshot of that moment in time with that lake. So what the electrofishing survey will tell us is how many size classes of bluegill do we have? If we get out there and we start shocking and we're getting only bluegill that are huge, you know, six to ten inches long, and no baby bluegills and no intermediate size bluegill, that tells us something. But if we get out there and we find six different size classes of bluegill, you know, from there to there to there to here to here to here, that tells us something else. So what that means is if we see one size class of bluegill and they're all big, those bass are seriously overcrowded. But if we see six different size classes of bluegills, then the food chain's probably not overeaten. And when we get out there and we're tooling around and we shock up five or six schools of threadfin shad that are now about two and a half inches long, that tells us something. When we weigh and measure those bass, if we weigh and measure those bass and and they're all 90 to 95 to 110 percent relative weights. That tells us something, you know. So what typically happens in an electrofishing in the fall survey? What that tells us is this: is that how well that lake did to produce its forage fish that year, and then how that extrapolated into fish growth for for largemouth bass. Now, it's still a safe recommendation to call bass 14 inches and under. That's a safe bet but be selective about it. You know, so if I had to give advice now, I'd say, you know what, cold bass 14 and under, be picky, 
If you catch a 14-inch bass that looks like an Alabama deputy sheriff, that's a Ray Scott quote, by the way, then throw it back. But if you catch a, a 13-inch bass that's skinny as a rail, looks like a long-distance runner, and it's a male, out it comes. You know? And so the, the angling data, while valuable, is not complete. It's biased. You know, and the electrofishing survey is biased by what you can capture on that day in that depth of water, in that clarity of water with electricity. But it's still a little bit more random than, than fishing with a swim bait. Doug Cusick, I just got back from feeding my catfish off the dock. Water temperature was 50 this morning, but warm to 54 to 40 to 55 degrees. Catfish were surfacing good. That's good. 55 degrees is about that magic number. Okay, Tyler says, several bass caught between three and four pounds. One never caught an eight-pound channel cat. We also have bullheads. You know, let's talk about that. One of the things I wanted to visit about with you guys is uh, uh, the relationship of different species of fish. So I'm going to make a comment here, and then I'm going to uh, circle back on that topic. Several bass caught between three and four pounds. Never caught an eight-pound net. Guess what an eight-pound channel cat eats? Anybody? Raise your hand. Oh, oh, there's hands up. An eight-pound channel cat eats anything it wants to. Its mouth is big enough it can eat a pound and a half bass. It can eat eight-inch bluegills, and it will. You know, people tend to think that channel catfish are, by nature, uh, scavengers. They're absolutely not. They're predator fish. They would much rather eat me. I look at them like a teenage boy. Teenage boy goes to the refrigerator, opens up the door. He's looking for meat. If he doesn't find meat, he's going to eat whatever he can get. Even if it has to be broccoli, he'll eat it. So, they're predators. They're top-end carnivores. So, they're gonna, that 8-pound channel catfish is competing with those 3- and 4-pound bass. So, that's important to know. West Leo has probably called some 4-pound four four pound bass. Absolutely not. Don't call any 4-pound bass. The four pound bass are just reaching the size that they can turn around and be calling the smaller bass. Almost every largemouth bass fishery, the number one problem it will, it will grow into is too many bass that are crowded in the size that's under 14 inches. So if you've got, you know, uh, four or five four pound bass per acre of water, they can actually turn back around and call some of those small fish which increases the average size of all your fish. So don't call any four pound bass plus, plus the four pound bass is a female. And we want to protect those because those are the ones that have the best genetic propensity to grow the largest. You know, I'm not going to tell you that a, that a male bass won't get big because I've heard tales and seen some that are pretty big. But the vast majority of males won't get much bigger than about 13 or 14 inches long. I see John Madsden in Illinois. Let's see here. Tommy Lineberger, we have about $1,800 that we now have been approved to spend specifically on structure for our 80-acre lake in North Carolina. I think you emailed me, and I haven't had time to answer this, but I'm, I'm going to answer that right now. How can we get the most bang for our buck on $1,800 worth of structure? We've been shopping Mossback brand. We would like to buy something already made. Well, I'm going to tell you that Mossback, they're great, project, uh, great products. Now, in an 80-acre lake, let me tell you what I would do. Get with some of your buddies, and you guys map the bottom of the lake, Tommy. That's real important, and I'm going to justify that. If you can map the bottom of the lake, an 80-acre lake, and then you can go back in and, and create a contour map of that lake, then the next thing you do is you get enough of the anglers to sit down with you with your map. So you've got this topo map, basically, that shows the contour lines. It shows you the shallow water, deep water, drop-offs. And if you can draw in existing structure that you see on your side scan sonar, on your electronics, or your live scope, whatever, somebody's going to have a live scope that you can use. But you guys plot out the bottom of that lake the very, very best that you can. And then what I would do then is talk with all the anglers and get them to say, hey, th here, here's the best places on the lake. And plot that on the map. And what you're going to find out in an 80-acre typical lake in North Carolina is there's going to be about 10 or 15 hot spots 
where people can consistently catch fish. And there's a reason for that. It's because that habitat is the most conducive for those fish to congregate where there's enough of them that you can catch some. Okay, so then what I would do then is, is all those different zones where the fishing is already good, mark those, give them a grade of A. And then there's going to be some where guys are saying, hey, yeah, I can catch some fish over here and figure out what those look like on the contour map. And you're going to have some A zones, then you're going to have some B zones, and then probably some C zones. And job one with your, with your habitat improvement is to go pick those A zones and enhance them. Get them where they can attract more bait fish. If they can attract more bait fish, and that's your focus, you want to attract more bait fish, more bluegill, more red ear. If you can attract them into some fish cities from mossback and bring them in tight, that's going to attract more bass. So enhance your A zones first, then go get more money and then do your B zones. So here's, here's kind of the general rule of thumb that I tell folks. I say, hey, if you can have 25 to 30% of the basin of a lake with, with fish communities and habitat, then you can improve your fishery. You know, now $1,800 worth of moss backs in an 80-acre lake is a good start. But that's not a finish. You're not, you're not at the finish line. So what you need to do there is be sure that there's enough spawning beds. Now, every, every fish community that I design in a brand new lake or a renovated lake, the first thing I do is start with spawning beds. You want spawning beds that range in depth from six inches down to three feet. And the thing you want to fun focus in on and, and, and create the best is beds for bluegills to have babies. And then adjacent to the spawning beds, that's where you need some dense cover. You know, that's where Christmas trees work, especially if they're standing up. You know, then just outside of that, that's where you've got some attractors for bigger bait fish as those bluegill get bigger. Remember, it takes 10 pounds of bait fish for a game fish to gain a pound. And so if your little bitty bluegills are getting eaten when they're that big, they're not significant. If you can provide them the right kind of habitat, and mossbacks are perfect for this, if you can find them the right kind of habitat to congregate and they can feed on the, the paraphyton and the plankton and things and the algae that are growing on those fish structures, then those fish, those bait fish are going to get bigger. <clears throat> if, you, if you can keep a bluegill alive for 45 days, it goes from 12,000 per pound to 35, 30 or 35 per pound. That's significant. So, map the lake, study the contour lines, visit with anglers and see where they're most successful. And I promise you, when you do that, you're going to see certain contours where angling success is better than others. And there's going to be drop-offs. Some There's going to be some feature under that water that's attractive to fish. Then you enhance it. That's a pretty good answer. <laughs> Zach Bollinger, I still have someone come out... Let's see, I'd still have someone come out since the size, they may have hit a nice spot, but with age, I'd take some out, but verify with a survey to see exactly how much. So here's what I'm going to tell him. <clears throat> I'm going to tell him we need to go ahead and do the survey, which I, I told that to the angler today. We're going to go ahead and do the survey, and I think we need to use the electrofishing boat to call some fish. Because what we can do is, as we weigh and measure fish, we're looking at relative weights of every one of those bass. And we can dadgum sure take some bass out that aren't making the grade in that lake. Now, here's what's really interesting about this. About 25 to 30% of the bass in any given lake are going to excel. Now, they're going to excel because they have the genetic propensity. They're going to excel because they're aggressive in nature. They're going to excel because they've got the, the um, opportunity in that body of water and the food chain. But even though those fish have the opportunity, so do the other 70%. They just don't make the grade in that lake. So what we'll try to do is identify those fish that aren't just, just aren't making the cut, and we'll call some of those, you know. And I know the angler wants to move some of those to another pond. I'm thinking we move those to the fillet knife. So we'll see how that goes. So, uh, and then we want to compare the, the food chain, you know, to the fish that we call as well. And something else, I think calling... I think culling bass with the electric fishing boat helps us be more picky and we're not necessarily culling the most aggressive fish in the lake. 
Because aggression is inherited. That's an inherited trait. Danny Mac, your friend Lurch, the great big blue heron, found some breeder bluegills and new hybrid stroppers in a small pool in our stream. He has no luck in the, you know what? I totally get that. Greg Beard, hi Bob, I got some Alabama tiger bass from Camp Lejeune. Should I get them a lawyer? <laughs> well, depends on what year span it was. If it was prior to 1980, you probably should have a little bit of a, yeah, you probably should get him a lawyer. Too soon. Ian, when is it too late to add fish to a pond in the fall? Um, would be bluegills from central Indiana. You know, I'm going to tell you, um, here's what I'm going to tell you. The benefits of adding fish in the fall is to fill a void in the food chain. That's first. If you have a void in the food chain, you don't mind writing a check, it's good to stock fish in the fall to help your game fish get in better shape to go into the winter because you're going to have a you're going to have winter in Indiana. The second reason is if you can stock some gravid bluegills and maybe get a lake spawn, which I don't know, I don't see that happening in Indiana now because it's too cool. Uh, it's too late to add them when the temperature is below 50. Then you don't really gain any benefit. The only other benefit is if your fish hatchery, you think they'll sell out this fall and you need some next spring, then it's okay to add them in the fall. You know, it, it'd be better to, to have them and not need them than to need them next spring and not have them. Chris Blood, Texas Hunter Products. Big sponsor. You know what? That right now is a good time to pause. Then I'm going to answer that answer that comment that, that Chris is making right there. You know, um, uh, Texas Hunter Feeders is one of the sponsors of the Institute of Higher Pondology next week. And Chris, I'm going to be ringing your number tomorrow and talk more about that. I've been behind and I'm catching up. Uh, a couple little trips kind of took me out. And now I'm back and catching up. But... Uh, Texas Hunter products, you know, not only are their feeders great because they are, but their customer service is the best. You know, I can send an email to Chris, and if he gets it typically before 2 o'clock on a weekday, and I order a feeder for somebody, for a client or a friend or somebody, that feeder goes out that day. You know, and other, other companies can't say that. Now, are they pricey compared to others? Yeah, they are. But you know what? You get what you pay for. I got a call from a guy a couple days ago that had gone to a box store and spent 300 bucks on a feeder and he was wanting to know if, 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 if I could sell him a timer. Well, no, you know, go to the, go to the box store and buy a timer. He said, well, they don't do that. They only sell the feeders. Well, then you got to go to the manufacturer. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But you know what? There are some of these other timers might adapt to those feeders. But the, here's the deal. Here's my point. Here's my point. Texas Hunter, you're going to pay a little more, but you're going to pay for quality for a feeder that lasts a lot longer. A lot longer. You know, a, a $1,000 feeder from Texas Hunter will last, I've got some that are in service now in their 10th and 11th years. That's a long time. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying things won't go wrong because it's a machine. Things will go wrong with machines, but the thing is, is, is Texas Hunter will back it up. And they all throw Purina fish food. Uh, I've told this story over and over and over. I love Purina Mills because of the commitment that they've made to quality. And, you know, since 1995, I've had a relationship with them, and they listen to me. If I call those guys, they listen to me. So if you ever have an issue, you call me, and I'm, I'll take it to them, and they're going to respond to it, and they're going to respond in a healthy way. And I appreciate that of those guys. Easy Docs of Texas, David Schneiderman. I haven't seen his name pop up tonight, but he's also a sponsor. As is HuntBirdDog.com. Jonathan Lusk. I know him. I've known him since he was little. Matter of fact, I was there when he was born. He's my son. HuntBirdDog.com. Chris Blood. There are other benefits to electrofishing than just identifying the bass size, right? Yes. Checking forage fish, other observations, getting a full survey over just some selective angling. Absolutely true. <clears throat> Chris is absolutely true. So when 
When I climb into an electric fishing boat, you bet, I want the data. That's the reason we're there. We want data. We want lengths and weights. We want size classes. Uh, I take copious notes, but I'll tell you something else I'm doing when I'm in that electric fishing boat. I'm looking at the color of the water. I'm looking for aquatic plants. I'm looking at the structure of the dam. What kind of shape is the spillway in? Uh, is the lake accessible for anglers? You know, is there anything that's askew? God said that word since I was in high school. Askew. Is there anything askew? So, I'm looking for things that are anomalies or things that are outside the norm. Because those little bitty clues can often give you the chance to be proactive to head off something that's coming. So, like, for example, um, if... Uh, here's, a, here's a classic example. I remember... Years ago, I went and electrofished a lake over east of Little Rock, Arkansas, near Lone Oak, Arkansas, at a, a fishing club. And the guys were upset they weren't catching any bass, and they'd been catching a lot of bass. So, launched the shocker boat, God, this is probably eight or ten years ago, and we were roaming around that lake, and we were shocking up bluegill in weird places, like in the middle of the lake, out of a treetop. Bluegill don't live there. They don't do that. <clears throat> then I came across a couple of underwater humps, where the water depth went from 15 feet to 4 feet. Bluegill everywhere. And they were all about that long. All about 3 or 4 inches long. And then we shocked up just a handful of bass. And so, but all over the lake there were bluegills. And I know, I knew, I know this. If, if that lake had any number, significant number of bass in it, those bluegill would, would have been around the edges or hanging out in cover and hiding. You know? So there were two, two clues right there that gave me an indication of what was going on with that lake. The bass numbers were low. The bluegill were distributed evenly around the entire lake. Even out in deep water, we'd be shocking, shocking bluegill up, even randomly out in water that maybe 18 or 19 feet deep. And they were all about three or four inches long. So what did that mean to me? What that meant to me was the bass numbers were low and had been for several months. That gave those bluegill a chance to get out in open water where they didn't feel threatened or didn't sense that they were going to get eaten. And they had several months to grow to be four inches long. You know, so we had to sit down and have a little powwow and they'd not seen a fish kill. They'd not seen any fish float up anywhere ever. But they did see a flock of cormorants come by and they did the best they could to chase them off. But being a fishing club, they weren't there every day and they had fired their caretaker. <clears throat> the caretaker, before they hired a new one in the fall, the caretaker was gone for two months. In that two-month span of time, the majority of their intermediate size to larger, you know, from, from 8 inches to 15-inch long bass had gotten eaten by flocks and flocks of cormorants. So, they had to go back in and restock with bass and feed their bluegills and start over. But if I hadn't seen those little nuances, I wouldn't have known what questions to ask them. Hello, Harrison Davis. Good to see you, buddy. Let's see here. Let me scroll down here and see what we got going on. Harrison Davis is from Georgia. Mark Hainline, you have talked to Tommy Lineberger about the 80-acre lake in our community. I'm the chairman of the lake and wildlife committee for our lake. Just a little history. The lake was dug out in 1997. It took two and a half years to fill and was only stocked once in 2000. The lake was completely ignored until I joined and took over the lake and wildlife committee. In mid-May 2021, I first conducted a bathymetric survey to let me know what the bottom... Perfect. Perfect. <coughs> that's good. The, uh, if you've got that bathymetric map, that's your starting point on what to do with the m budget that you've got for the... Uh, uh, the fish structure. Oh, holy cow, look at here, Chris. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I'm never speechless, but I think I should be. <laughs> yes, take a look at Texas Hunters, Texas Angler products as well, guys. Yeah, I'm rolling my eyes in the back of my head there, Chris. You know what I'm talking about. Doug Brown, wow, didn't know male bass normally don't get over there. Yeah, they don't. I mean, a 14, 15 inch. I'll tell you this. Out of 100 male bass, 90 of them 
Don't get over 13 inches long, 14 inches long, maybe, maybe. The rest of them, there's some that do. And on a very, very rare occasion, there'll be some that are huge. As a matter of fact, they've got one at the Texas Freshwater Fishery Center that's in double digits. And you can pretty well bet they're using that in their breeding program. But the majority of the bass in your bodies of water are going to be 14 inches and smaller. And if you think about it, it makes sense because a significant amount of their life when they should be growing, they're on a bed. They're taking care of nests. They're, they're hatching eggs. They're not eating. They're defending and they're losing weight. Hello, Larry Hardesty. There's Mike Cook checking in from North Carolina. We've got a lot of North Carolina going on today. <coughs> Scott, on your point of surveying, our lake's forage was decimated before this year. We stocked gizzard shad at 43 pounds per acre. Good gosh, that's a lot of gizzard shad. And 100 bluegill per acre, approximately 5 inches long. The bass have grown tremendously in the past 6 months. The females gained 1 to 2 pounds. However, that shad population seems decimated. I only see tiny bluegill from this year's spawn at the feeder. The other odd thing is I have not seen a big gizzard shad even cruising the shallows. There's a big creek that feeds the lake will those gizzard shad go up the creek they'll go up the creek without a paddle i hope somebody's laughing at that as corny as it is so i'm going to scroll down here oh boy i'm getting behind so i'm going to bust through this uh okay so you know what let me i'm going to ask you a question scott do you know why they call a gizzard shad a gizzard shad anybody anybody know that it's because they have drum roll a gizzard Gizzard shad are bottom feeders. They root around in the mud. So absolutely, yes, gizzard shad will go up a creek. And if you stock 43 pounds per acre, I cannot imagine that those things have been, they may have been eaten a lot of. If they have, then your bass have gained significant amounts of weight. But as fast as gizzard shad grow under ideal conditions, and if they've got mud that they can root around in, you're going to get some gizzard shad that knock the door on two pounds. Or at two pounds. So they're going to get really big. Will they go up the creek? Absolutely, yes, they will. Because they're looking for mud. Because what they do is, is gizzard shad has a nose. Their mouth is underneath. They have a gizzard inside and a really, really long digestive system. And so what they do is, is they'll filter the mud. And, and with these long gill rakers in the back of their throats, they're sending food and debris and organic matter and dirt down their, their gullet. And when they do that, then they're spending time in the mud and they're just kind of rooting things up and that's where they like to be. You know, and they grow really, really, really fast. They only spawn one time a year, so and they spawn a lot when they do. So e even if even if the numbers have been decimated, all you need is about five to ten gizzard shad per acre, and they will load you back up with gizzard shad next year. Daddy Mac, I keep our twenty pound channel catfish Cat, channel cat full of feed pellets and busy chasing the extra pellets. <clears throat> I see no fear among any of the other fish at feeding time. Well, congratulations. <laughs> They're, uh, I guarantee you those 20 pound channel catfish, they will not thumb their nose at some kind of other offering that swims by. You know, yours might, but I don't see it. I mean, I've been around those 20 pound catfish. All right, so now Mark Hainline says, next I had an electrofishing survey done. The results were that we had no structure. We also were told that we have too many and not enough food. Too many bass and not enough food. The bathymetric survey provided us with locations to put structure. So we've been making artificial structure since January 2022. This is what Tommy's talking about. Okay, okay, now Mark, here's, here's what I'm going to tell you. There's five key components to, to good lake management. Number one is happy water. Now, as you, as you go back and watch some of these podcasts, you hear me preaching that. I mean, I'm standing on the Palm Boss pulpit preaching that all the time. If the water's happy, then the fish have a chance to be happy. The second thing, and it's in the order I'm going to give to you, the water's the most important thing first. If that medium isn't healthy, it doesn't even have to be clean. It just needs to be healthy. If you don't have healthy water all the time, and the fish have certain seasons that they stress out because the water chemistry is no good or the water quality deteriorates, then they're gonna, you're going to struggle to see them grow. 
The next most important piece is the habitat element. That's what you guys are working on now. As goes the habitat, so goes what lives in it. Part of the reason that, you're, that you have a lake that's crowded with bass is because you don't have any habitat. And that's conducive to little bitty bass can access all the fish, all the bait, all the food. You know, and so what happens is you get all these little gangster bass running around eating everything they can as soon as it comes off the nest. And there's no chance for a food chain to establish because there's no habitat. So as you add this habitat, what you're basically doing is trying to create areas where bass can congregate around forage fish. So the next piece of the puzzle is the food chain. It takes 10 pounds of bait fish for a bass to gain a pound. So if you don't have good healthy water all the time and habitat to support the different sizes of the different species of fish, then you're not going to have the healthiest fishery that you can have. So if you don't have the healthiest fishery, you don't have the right food chain. So that's where the elements of bluegill and red air sunfish, and we're talking about gizzard shad here on this one, but I don't, I don't want you guys running out stocking gizzard shad without talking to me about it first or talking to your pro about it. There's some caveats about gizzard shad. You don't want gizzard shad stocked into a lake that, that can't receive them. You don't want to trade problems. There's, there's what I'm going to tell you. So then as you, as you know that your water chemistry is happy, your water quality is happy and healthy, and then you enhance your habitat, the next thing you're going to see is your food chain is going to start to get bolstered. Now, as your food chain starts to grow up and you start getting those different size classes of the different bait fish, then you're going to see your bass begin to gain weight, except for some size classes that just won't because they're too crowded. That's when you're culling. So when you're talking about having too many bass, you know, an 80-acre lake, let me tell you, with an 80, here, here's part of the problem with an 80-acre lake. It's like a choo-choo train. You can't turn the locomotive around on a dime like you can Tim Stewart's little sports car. Happy birthday, Tim. We love you, buddy. <laughs> so, you're going to have to be patient with that lake as you turn it around. And what that means is, how many bass do you need to call out of an 80-acre lake that hasn't been managed for 15 years? Well, you know, the standard number is 20 to 25 bass per acre. Let's do that math. That's 2,000 bass per, per, for the lake per year. And that's probably not enough. You know, so when you start telling anglers that they need to take out every bass under 14 inches in a mindset where we play catch and release and we throw them back so they can get bigger, then you're fighting an uphill battle. So part of your job job is to, is to learn more about it and then educate your members. And the more you can educate your members, then the more successful you're going to be with your management strategy. You know, and so culling bass, I, I would I would weigh and measure as many of them as you can. And then you compare your bass to standards. If you don't have that standard chart, email me, I'll send it to you. If you want a, a, a spreadsheet where you can, and I'll tell you what, better yet, better yet, go to Smartfish app, look up Smartfish app. Wade Bales from South Carolina has developed a very cool online app that you can load to your phone. And when you catch a fish and you weigh it, measure it, you can plug the length and weight in, and it's going to give you an immediate score or a grade for those fish. And what you're after is, is fish that score a 95 or higher. You want all your fish to be valedictorians. If they don't score high enough, out they go. They don't make the cut. You know, so culling is going to continue to be a big deal. I would bet you for the Next couple of years, if you guys can work hard enough to cull three to 4,000 bass out of that lake, then you'll start to see a difference. Because here's where it really gets fun, guys. When you take an 80-acre lake <clears throat> that hasn't had the kind of management that you expect or that you'd want, it's had a, a jump start to get to where it is. So now you've got a whole lot of bass that are 9 to 14 inches long that could be 7 years old. So as you're culling bass and you're thinning their numbers down, the remaining fish that are left, are they going to grow and get big? Probably not. So the fish that are remaining are going to be those that, that have lost the majority of their growth potential. So it's going to be really the next, the youngest fish that will have the chance to get up and get to be, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine pounds. So uh, whoever did your electrofishing survey, it might behoove you. Holy cow, I said another word I don't ever say. 
to have them come again and help you with some harvest. You know, and uh, one of the catch-22s, I mean, I can hear it in your voice right now. You're kind of, I hear it over the computer. You guys are saying, well, wait a minute, we got 1800 bucks for Habitat. That's a good start. <clears throat> and it's really, really, really hard to pull the money out of pockets of people that don't understand the value of what they're trying to do. You know, so that means you guys are going to have to do a lot of that yourselves. And, and, and I can certainly empathize with you. I get that. You know, I've worked on a bunch of 80 acre lakes myself where the, you know, where the, uh, where the budgets are limited. So I know. Hey, Victor Moberg from Smithville, Texas. Good to see you, buddy. Great knowledge on the 45 day growth period. It does, that does put it in perspective. Okay. So Scott says also, we recently just stocked a hundred tiger bass around 12 inches. Would it be okay to stock 10 pounds per acre of gizzard shad before the shad spawn? Oh, yeah, it would do no harm. You know, you must be able to get gizzard shad pretty cheap somewhere from somebody that is saning them out of a lake or something. So if you can do that, you know, I'm, it, for, for everybody else other than Scott, I'm going to tell you this. <clears throat> I don't recommend gizzard shad in lakes unless I know that at least 25 pounds per acre of the bass in that given lake are three pounds or bigger. Because gizzard shad grow so big so fast that I don't want to end up with a hell bunch of gizzard shad that are too big for the bass to eat them. Shatter sheep at a buck and a half a pound. Yeah, I'll tell you what, if you can do that, that's pretty dead gum cheap. If you've got enough three pounders to keep the gizzard shad in check, I'm okay with that. Larry Hardesty, would it be best to stock more rim now or wait this spring? Depends on the goal. You know, if, if the mission is is to get your bass or your walleye or your smallies or whatever in, in better shape going into the winter, then stock some now. And I'll tell you this, the supply chain is going to be higher now than it will be in the spring. The fish are probably going to cost less now. Here's the downside. If you stock them now, then they're not going to grow much in your pond. If that's okay with you, that's okay with me. Um, the risk of them being eaten by your game fish is higher because they're going to be in there, you know, from now until they can spawn. You know, so it, it really kind of depends on the mission. That's the way I'm going to answer that. So that there's, there's good reasons to do it now, and there's good reasons to not do it now and wait until spring. So it kind of depends... I get, you know, I'm, I'm really used to giving you a direct answer. I'm going to tell you, ask your producer, ask your supplier if there's any risk of them running out of fish this fall. If the answer is yes, we're probably going to sell all of our fish, buy some now. If they say, no, 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 we'll have some in the spring, then you get your name on that list. Get your name at the very top of the list and you get some as soon as you can stock them next spring. I don't remember where you are, Larry, but... You know, if you're in the Midwest, you want to stock them by about the 1st of April. If you're in the South, stock them around the end of February, 1st of March. Let's see what Harrison says here. We caught a 5-inch Young of the Year brim that looked like a bluegill but had red eyes in North Georgia. What is your guess as to the species of the sunfish? I'm going to tell you it's a bluegill with red eyes. I've seen bluegill with red eyes. So, uh, hell, I can guess anything and be wrong, and I can guess something and be right. But my guess is that you caught a five-inch long, young-of-the-year brim that looked like a bluegill but had red eyes. I'm going to tell you it's a red-eyed bluegill. <laughs> Some of you guys are laughing at that. I hear you. But I'm not trying to be a smarty pants, but that's the way I see it. I've seen lots of bluegill with red eyes. Larry Hartnerstein, in Alabama, what's the difference of adding brim in the fall versus adding them in the spring? What time of the year is best? In Alabama, I'd lean more toward saying, hey, you know what, if you can get them in the fall and they're big enough to reproduce, odds are high that you're going to get a spawn this fall. And even in those bluebird days next January, February in Alabama. So if they're adults and, they're, and, they're, and bluegills are big and the supply is good, uh, I don't have any qualms putting some in the fall. You know, so it's, it's, it, the, the answer is going to track back to what's the mission. You know, if the mission is to enhance your food chain because your bass are not in good shape, do it in the fall. <clears throat> if you want to stock some bigger bluegills in the fall so you can get an additional spawn before winter, 
Stock them in the fall. If not, wait till next spring. Okay, Frank James. Looks like he got an electrofishing survey done. Recent shocking showed two numerous largemouth bass had chowed down on eating the size of coppernose bluegill due to low water. Plenty of coppernose in the one to three inch category, above nine inches, not much in between. That is a that is a classic sign of a lake in a drought where the bass are just gorging themselves on the young of the year bluegill. The bass seem to be crowded, but you also know that when your water's down three feet, <coughs> when your water is down three feet, that's probably the same volume of water as the rest of the lake. So the volume of your lake is 50% of what it was when it was full. So now Frank is saying, but I need to fill the missing medium-sized bluegill. Should I stock a few hundred this fall or wait for what? I'd wait for the water to rise. Because when the water rises, you're going to see your bluegills reproduce. One thing you're not saying is, is uh, what kind of shape the, the bass are in. All right, Michael Eric, here he is. Hello, Michael. Hello, Bubba Lusk, my cousin from Mineral Wells, America. Scott's laughing. It's got a gizzard. There you go. Richard Williams. Hey, Bob. Been reading the magazine. It has so much information in it. I'm surprised. I'm surprised, too, because I write a whole lot of that stuff. New subscriber a few months ago. Should I add bass to the pond now or should I wait till the spring? Um, hey, Doug. The email address is info at pondboss.com. Um, Richard, uh, should you ask, add bass now? I don't have enough information to give you a good answer on that. Should you add bass to the pond now or wait? You know what? You don't, um, I don't have enough information. What kind of food chain do you have? You know, what kind of bass are in there now? Um, do you want to, you know, one thing with, with our 80 acre lake friends, our friends with 80 acre lake in North Carolina, uh, I didn't finish that, that statement. Happy water, great habitat, food chain. Then the next piece is the best genetics. But I did spend some time on harvest. There's your five key components. Happy water, great habitat, food chain, superior genetics, which you're not ready for that yet, and cull, 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 harvest. <clears throat> so, Richard, I can't give you a good answer because I don't know. And I, I need to ask you some more questions like, what are your bait fish like? How many, you know, how, how many bluegills do you have? You know, what's your structure like? What's your habitat like? Then I could give you a better answer. So, um, I'm going to tell you until until you can answer some questions, don't stock any bass. Let's see here. Look at there. Oh, the guys are making friends. I love this. Doug and Tyler. Look at that. All right. Oh, look at that. We've got a good thing going on. Stephen Martin. I haven't heard anyone talk about... Uh-oh. I got, I got slam dunked here. Hang on. Stephen Martin. I haven't heard anyone talk about stocking shiners in their pond. Any drawbacks to putting them in a half-acre pond? Um, here's the way I approach that. I look at each size class of each species of fish as a tool. So, golden shiners reproduce once a year, maybe twice in the spring. They spawn in the spring. They uh, run in schools of similar size fish. They're pretty good forage fish for largemouth bass and for uh, hybrid stripers and even for walleye. Uh, smallmouth bass to some extent as well. Stocking shiners is basically what you're doing there is you're diversifying the food chain. So, bluegill are the backbone of the food chain. Uh, red air sunfish and pumpkin seeds for northern and middle, uh, midwestern ponds, those are kind of more like an insurance policy, whereas the shad species help diversify, and that's what shiners do well. The drawbacks to putting shiners in a half-acre pond is, is if a significant number of them do not get eaten, then they turn around and they're nest predators. So they can, uh, especially in small waters, in a half-acre pond, they can prey pretty heavily on bluegill eggs and bass eggs. They can inhibit reproduction. You know, now you can take them out of that some by feeding them. However, you can't feed them out of their instincts. Hey, there's your quote of the day. You cannot feed a fish out of its instincts. It's got instincts. So let's see here. I just started feeding about three weeks ago. I'm only seeing one to three inch bluegill at the feeder. 
Scott says they have made their home there where there's there's a ton of cover. I like I'm seeing a ton of small ones, but nervous that's all I got. Um nervous that that's all you've got. Um I don't know that I'd be nervous about it because if you've got one to three inch bluegill at the feeder and they're on that feed, they're going to jump and grow really, really fast. And even if you are a little low on bigger ones, they're going to fill that gap. And it won't take them long to fill the gap. Okay, so Frank's doing a little follow-up here. He says, uh-oh. Largemouth bass relative weight fell from 89 this spring to 84. Shock since we harvested aggressively, but lack of ideal eating size copper nose probably means they got eaten months ago. That's probably true. And so it sounds to me, Frank, like you need to be calling a few more bass, which, you know, that's not unusual in a drought. But I'll tell you what, in a drought, it's... It, when, when Here's something that fishers biologists do that kind of wears me out. I, I don't like it. It's, they may and measure, may, may uh, measure and weigh a hundred bass. And then they'll, they'll see that the relative weights range from 72% to 105. Then they'll average them to 89. Well, that's bull. You know, because we know there's going to be a percentage of those fish that are thriving in that lake. So, I don't like to see the average relative weight. I want to see the relative weight of all those fish because there's going to be a class of fish in that lake that are thriving in that circumstance. You know, and so don't 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 be so disappointed by an average relative weight of 84. But what that means to me is that you need to be aggressively culling bass whose whose relative weights are lower than about 90. But I, I know enough about this to know that there's going to be some bass in that sample set that were above 90 all the way up over 100. And those are the heroes in that lake. Those are the ones that need to stay put. <clears throat> so Scott says if they're bigger ones, it's possible they just haven't found the feeder. Yeah, that is possible. It's not real likely, but it's possible. Tim Stewart says shiners get eaten quickly. They do in South Florida for sure. There's other areas of the country they don't. But in South Florida, I mean, you can't keep enough. Harrison Davis. Red-eyed bluegill. Richard Williams. Oh, no bass in the pond now. Stock brim and fat head minnows about five months ago. Pond appears to be doing great. Lots of fish when feeding Aquamax 500 every morning. Just not sure about adding bass yet. Half acre pond. Um... Um, and you know what? It's going to make a difference to where you are as well. Hello, Christy Berg, Logan, Kansas. Good to see you. So what I'm going to tell you, Richard, is if you are, if you are in the southern tier of states, I'm going to say Oklahoma, uh, Arkansas, Mississippi, um, Alabama, going up the coast, North Carolina, even into Virginia, if you're east and south of that line, so South Louisiana, hell yeah, put the bass in, dude. Stock your bass. You're ready. Go ahead and do it. Yes, get it done. Don't wait. You're set. South Louisiana, go get it. Absolutely. Do it, do it, do it. Well, hey, we're about to run out of uh, time here, folks. 728 already. And, you know, I really appreciate everybody watching this show. It tickles me to death to know that there's this many people they want to hang out and talk about ponds and lakes and fish and things. And, and uh, uh, you're welcome. And it's just it just kind of keeps me going. I love it. And I, I deeply appreciate it. I really do. And you guys, hey, you know the drill. Hey, I haven't said this yet today. Palm Boss Magazine, $35 a year. Cheaper than a Friday night day and it lasts a year. And it's full of nuggets. And if you go out to eat dinner and you eat nuggets... They're gone the next day. These last a long time. So uh, please subscribe to Palm Boss if you haven't. The Institute of Higher Pondology is next week. I've got one slot open, and I don't mind if we don't uh, if we don't fill it. I'm actually okay with that. So uh, we're going to have a great time, and 
Let's see, next Wednesday night. Heck, I, you know what? I'm going to be at that ranch. So I will figure out how to broadcast next Wednesday night from the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology. Leah, <laughs> Leah likes nuggets, <laughs> especially palm off nuggets. 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date. You guys know that. So I'm going to be broadcasting from the original Texana Ranch next Wednesday, and I bet you we'll have a guest or two because we're going to have some people there. They're going to hang out with us the next few days and learn as much as they can. Greg Russell tells me to keep it up. I will do that. I deeply appreciate it. So, you know what? Until next Wednesday, thanks for tuning in and watching this show. We will see you then. Until then, adios.